This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sanjay Reddy. Um, he is uh, an assistant professor, um, pardon me, associate professor, I just gave him a promotion, uh, yeah, a clinical professor here in medicine at UCSF. Uh, Dr. Reddy is a hospitalist in the division of hospital medicine and the medical director for the congestive heart failure and bone marrow transplant. Uh, he also serves uh, in the inpatient setting for integrative medicine services and is, uh, works in consultation and provides care at the Osher Center, combining the fields uh, of medicine and acupuncture uh, to provide comprehensive evaluations and, and uh, care plans for his patients. Uh, on a personal note, Sanjay's been very kind to also work alongside you know, the various aspects of our pain medicine a division and communities, participated in our various other educational efforts and clinical efforts around pain management, and very much look forward to hearing his talk this evening. And in particular, it'll be interesting to, to see as the talk progresses um, how, how these various techniques can come together for treating such a wide range of of uh, painful complaints or, or pain that may be associated with a particular disease process. And these may range from things from headaches to, to back pain, areas that we're still struggling with clinically. So it's my pleasure, Dr. Reddy. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for the introduction, Mark. So today I'm going to talk. I didn't come up with this title, but I thought it was a great one, the East Meets West Acupuncture and Beyond. And so kind of just wanted to start off with the goals of the session. So I'm going to review acupuncture for you. Do you explore this kind of Eastern concept of health that we hear a lot about, um, give an overview of applications on how we can apply that to pain. And then ideally, you'll be able to leave here empowered with some things that you could immediately do if you are suffering from chronic pain or just things for general health. So a roadmap of what that's going to look like. Brief review of acupuncture history, I mean really, really brief. Um, recap of the Western and Eastern ideas and understanding of how acupuncture works. A touch on the controversy with acupuncture and acupuncture research. An examining of pain, kind of just the idea of pain and what it is and how that applies to a person when we look at them holistically. Um, then there's a bit of a whirlwind overview of different um, integrative medicine modalities and how we can apply those to a person. And then discussion and questions. So how many people in the room have had acupuncture before or get it regularly? Okay, great, so that's a lot. Okay, um, acupuncture is, uh, was initially developed in ancient China, although a lot of people will argue that it was developed in ancient Tibet and that we just lost all the research from, um, and writings from then. It's attributed to the Yellow Emperor, and the initial text that we have on that is the Huangdi Neijing, which is written sometime between the second and fifth century before Christian era. What's interesting about that is the Yellow Emperor lived thousands of years before that. And so it's a little bit difficult when we get into ancient China. It flourished during the Ming Dynasty in the 1300s to 1600s. And it was popularized in the United States during the Nixon administration. Once the trip to China happened, James Resson, who was a New York Times reporter, suffered acute appendicitis while he was in China. And his pain postoperatively was entirely controlled with acupuncture. And he wrote about it, and then there was a flurry of acupuncture and porcupine jokes in America. Um, it's an increasingly used. About 3.5 million people reported they used it in the 2012 National Health Institute survey. Uh, that was up from 
up a little bit from 2007, where 3 million people used it, which was up significantly from 2002, where 1 million people reported using it. It's rooted in these Chinese medicine concepts, and it was created in a Taoist culture. And so a lot of the Chinese medicine terms and acupuncture terms use this agrarian Taoist language. So the same way you describe weather, you're going to describe a condition in the human body. And the idea in that is that a person is inseparable from nature, and so you have to treat the whole thing. Um, it's based on this concept of harmony and the idea that the disease is also inseparable from the person. The kind of Chinese medicine components of that, and this is also true for Ayurveda for the most part. Um, acupuncture points are used in Ayurveda. They're called marmo points, and they're not necessarily needled. But it focuses on diet, physical activity, and exercise. So this is often Qigong and Tai Chi. Meditation, which is also often Tai Chi and Qigong. Uh, herbs, Twina, which is kind of a acupuncture massage. And Gua Sha. And by the way, if any of you speak Chinese, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering the appropriate pronunciation of these. Um, gua Sha, which is often called scraping or it's cupping, is also a similar form of that. And then Moxibustion, which is an herb that's often used um, as a tonification thing. Have any of you had moxa in the room? It's really interesting, right? It's kind of hard to explain why it works, but it has this really powerful warming effect. And there have been a lot of studies on moxibustion in pregnancy, particularly, and reversing breech deliveries. And it's, it's kind of fascinating. Um, so acupuncture in this Chinese view, we, we tend to take out acupuncture when we talk about it in America. But it's really part of this larger system of Chinese medicine. And the idea is that you're using these needles to access the energetic pathways in the body. And that alterations in the normal flow of energy in somebody is what leads to <laughs> disease, unhappiness, or any sort of condi or painful condition. And so this idea of disharmony is really important again. So this is, um, <laughs> so there's a lot of public domain pictures I chose for this since it's being videotaped. And so this was the best one I could find on acupuncture points. This is the, the view of the back. There's a bunch of acupuncture meridians running throughout the body. There's uh, six main ones on the upper body and six on the lower, um, on both sides. And the idea with the acupuncture treatment is that you're not just treating the points, or, which each has specific properties, but you're also treating the meridians to kind of access the energy of that, of that organ system. So in, the, in Western medicine, or in, in basic science research in the West, what we found is that acupuncture points may have unique properties. Or acupuncture, and, and a lot of them will have denser innervation, there'll be more tightly packed connective tissue, and different receptor distribution at those sites. And the TRV1 receptor is one of the ones that has been found to be increased in acupuncture points. And that's down at the level of the fascia. So if any of you have had deep, deep tissue massage work, that's kind of the level where we think acupuncture points live. There's also been a lot of interesting research looking at it and its effects on the central opiate system. So if you give somebody Narcan, which is a medication that blocks the effects of morphine, heroin, and other opiates, it also will block the analgesic effects of acupuncture, um, which, is, which is pretty fascinating. There also seems to be something related to spinal and, and um, supraspinal neurotransmitter release, but we're really still just getting a handle of how a lot of this is working. And then there's also some research that shows that local inflammatory mediators are released at the site, which can explain kind of some of the, the anal immediate analgesic effects. So we're, there's a lot of controversy in acupuncture research, and that's, for the most part, when you look at papers, you're going to see very strong statements saying acupuncture works for everything or acupuncture doesn't work for anything. And part of the problem is that we can't measure this idea of qi or energy, that the, the way the system was developed in ancient China or ancient Tibet, depending on who you talk to. And then there's the big question that I think, as somebody who's looking into this more and doing some research into it, the big question that none of our systems or understanding can, can get us to is, how would, did somebody come up with this system? And how were these acupuncture points discovered? There's nothing in the medicine that I've learned so far in medical school or, or residency that, or, or post-residency that would lead me to, to decide that these points are each going to have these specific effects that we, kinda, that we see reproducibly. Um, so people do tend to split between two things. And Ted Chap Kapchuk describes this beautifully in his book, The Web That Has No Weaver. Um, into believing that acupuncture is all placebo or that it's the greatest thing that's ever been and it's panacea and will treat everything. S both of those are probably equally dangerous thoughts. It kind of makes it difficult for us to look into it further. But just keep that in mind as, um, as we're kind of talking about a few things. And it hasn't helped the research history behind acupuncture. Prior to 50 years ago, it was done apprentice, uh, teacher to apprentice. And there wasn't research really done on it. What makes it more challenging 
is that the idea of health in acupuncture is distinctly different from the way that we view health in Western medicine. Um, when I see somebody in the hospital, if they have pneumonia, we are evaluated on our standard of care and treating everybody the same. So if you come into the hospital and you're not given the appropriate antibiotics, or you're not given, and you're not given them in a timely enough manner, regardless of, of who you are, um, that, is a, that is a failure on our part as a hospitalist or as an internal medicine doctor. In Chinese medicine, everybody in this room could present with pneumonia. I hope, I hope none of you do. Um, but everybody in this room could, could present with pneumonia, and each of you could have a different Chinese medicine diagnosis. The idea being that you have your individual constitution that makes you prone to certain insults and injuries. And based on that, that constellation of imbalance inside of you needs to be treated specifically, and that's what's led to this syndrome that we tend to group together as pneumonia. So it could be a wind invasion in one person, it could be spleen dampness in another person, and both of those would have very different treatments in acupuncture. That makes it extremely difficult to study because our model uses diagnosis and treatment, and then there's a control for that treatment. And that's how most of the acupuncture studies have been done in the last few years that we tend to talk about, and it's, it's a little bit difficult because that doesn't quite fit with the understanding in Chinese medicine. So a lot of times when I look at a study, um, it's kind of hard to say what are we actually studying if we're not using the system of thought that, that created the system that we don't quite understand yet. Um, and there are many, there are many uh, acupuncture studies that aren't that great quality. They often won't have controls because it is difficult to do a control. And there's also a challenge with sham acupuncture. So a lot of acupuncture research will do what's called sham acupuncture. And the way that this is probably appropriately thought of is, is the, the correct treatment will use acupuncture points that are specified for the condition, and then the other one, someone just kind of goes in and puts needles in somebody. Um, the challenge with that is a lot of those needles that you just put in on somebody are on the appropriate meridians and will still have a treatment effect depending on how they're done. And so it's really hard and really difficult to study acupuncture. Um, and I realize that sounds like an excuse, but it is true, and, and we're working on ways around that. Despite the challenges, in 1997, the National Institutes of Health came out with a report of efficacy. And this was the kind of the first time in the United States a big government agent came out and said, we think acupuncture works and we think it works specifically for this. And most of these you'll see are pain syndromes, also nausea and asthma and stroke rehab and addictions. But a lot of it is pain. In 2002, the, the World Health Organization released a statement. The basic summary of this is that you should use acupuncture for pain treatments because of the risks and side effects of long-term opiate use. The main thing that I think is important to think about when we're using a modality that we don't understand necessarily that well from our typical framework of thought is how safe is it? Fortunately, acupuncture is very, very safe. Um, they did this big study in Germany where they looked at over 95,000 people who had over 700,000 treatments with what we would consider minimally, relatively minimally trained acupuncturists. So most of them had 140 hours of training, um, whereas a licensed acupuncturist here has thousands. Um, and most physician acupuncturists here have 300 or more. Only 20% of the people in this study of the doctors who were doing this had over 350 hours of training. And in all of these treatments, there were five major adverse effects, events. Um, that is less, I would suspect, than the number of adverse events with getting your blood drawn. Um, so this is exacerbation of depression, an acute hypertensive crisis, so somebody's blood pressure went really high, vasovasal reaction leading to loss of consciousness, which happens frequently with blood draws, so that just means somebody had acupuncture and then they passed out. An asthma attack that led to high blood pressure and chest pain. That's a little strange, but it can happen. Um, and then pneumothoraces, which is where the lung kind of peels away from the, the lung pleura, the lining, and that's because a needle hit the lung. And that does happen, but infrequently, two in 700,000 times. Um, and so that's because some acupuncture points are pretty close to the lung, and so when most of us do those, we're really cautious. We'll pull up the muscle and, and be extremely careful because that's the worst thing I can think of us doing is, is causing a pneumothorax. This was a list of the non-serious events with it. So about 3% of people reported some needling pain with it. About 3% had a small hematoma, which is just kind of a collection of blood. 1.4% um, had a little bit of bleeding. I actually think that's probably underreported. I think a lot of times acupuncture points bleed. Um, I, I'd say in a given day in clinic for me, if someone hasn't had bleeding, it would be really surprising. And it's usually just a little bit or a drop. Um, some people had orthostatics problems. That means when you're going from sitting to standing, you get a little lightheaded, your blood pressure drops a little bit. And that often will happen with acupuncture. Forgotten needles happen in um, 
a few hundred people, that's, that's something we can easily avoid. Um, and so fortunately, I, don't, I have a better success rate than that so far. Um, and then the, there was some local skin irritation and deterioration of symptoms, headache and fatigue. So all these kind of minor things related to it, but out of 700,000 treatments, this is a pretty impressive, pretty impressive record of safety. In 2012, the Archives of Internal Medicine did a review of chronic pain, and they did this in a really, really interesting way. So Vickers took, there were 31 randomized controlled trials that met their inclusion criteria for quality. They extracted the raw data. They were able to get the raw data from 29 of those. And then they did a meta-analysis, and they did a review of it. And they found that the patients receiving acupuncture had less pain than sham, even, for back pain, neck pain, osteoarthritis, and chronic headaches. Um, and th their conclusion was that acupuncture is effective for the treatment of chronic pain. I've never met Vickers, but I would like to because he does these great studies on acupuncture. But it is important to know that the year before, there was a 2011 um, review article in pain where they had the exact opposite conclusion, which is part of the reason that they did this where they extracted the raw data. And a lot of times I'll hear two people discussing the same acupuncture paper, and one person will say this is proof that it works, and another person will say that this is proof that it doesn't work. And I think that just underscores how poorly we're able at a basic science level so far to understand the mechanics of acupuncture. And that's, that's a future, an area of future work and, and a lot of research. And, and maybe something uh, Dr. Schumacher will pick up at some point. So for those of you, most of you have had acupuncture, so this what to expect slide is not going to be that helpful. But the needles are really, really tiny for those of you who haven't. They're usually between 0.16 millimeters and 0.30 millimeters. That's a 30 to 35 gauge. That means a bunch of those will fit into the smallest needle that you get your blood drawn with. Um, many people who have it fall asleep, I would say, um, at least in America. In, in China, they tend to use a more vigorous needle stimulation that can be quite painful. And, it, and a lot of times, if I have a Chinese patient now, um, they will be disappointed that they're not getting the same, that kind of same vigorous stimulation. But here, most people tend to fall asleep, and a lot of people report it feels like a deep meditation. For some people, it is not enjoyable. For some people, they have it and they can't relax the whole time, and they just feel tense or they'll move and it makes it more painful. Um, and so I tend to warn people that most people like it, but you may not. And if you don't, we'll figure out something else we can do. Because I don't, it always is uncomfortable as an acupuncturist when you're putting needles in somebody who hates the entire experience. And so I'll try to find another way that we can get the same results. The typical succession, so there's a huge focus on history. Um, and then the physical exam is really, I mean, there's discussion of all these other things, seeing, smelling, and kind of appreciating the person as a person, but really comes down to the pulse and tongue, which have almost minimal to no bearing in my typical Western medicine evaluation. Um, the pulse and tongue are very complicated, and there's not that much consistency in research. So for those of you who do go see an acupuncturist, they should be checking your pulse and tongue every time. If they're not, that's not necessarily ideal, and so you just have a discussion with them about why. But the pulse and tongue really is, is quite important. Um, the session could last minutes to an hour. Some acupuncture styles just put the needle in and take it out. Others leave it in for a longer time. And it could be five to 20 needles. Really, I've seen acupuncture sessions that are one needle. It depends on who the acupuncturist and what their style is. I had a patient come in, um, and he said he was just watching ESPN. And a football player went into an acupuncturist and had you know, 200 needles in his back. And so then another football player went in, and this is all NFL players, and said, that guy had 200 needles. I want 300 needles. <laughs> and so, so he got it, which must have taken an hour to put in. I don't even know. So I, that is, the number of needles do not equal treatment power. <laughs> um, and I don't even know where, you, I mean, I guess they're really bulky. So you could fit a few hundred needles in places other people could maybe get one. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind. A lot of times people want more needles, and that doesn't necessarily make a more powerful treatment. It depends on what you're treating and what your goals are and what, what you're trying to do. And it also depends on the style of acupuncture you're doing. Um, usually, it's about one to three times per week in the beginning. Um, in the original development of acupuncture, it was mostly daily. But for whatever reason, even though I don't think we accomplish more in a day or a week, we're busier now than people were uh, thousands of years ago. And so that's really hard for people to do. So we tended to focus our treatments and probably treat a little differently than they used to and aim for one to three times a week uh, for the first eight weeks. The real, the goal is whatever imbalance the person has or whatever problem they have, by doing this frequent acupuncture in the beginning, you can start to space it out. And so it, the, you don't want to necessarily be seeing somebody one to three times a week for the rest of their lives. 
you would ideally be able to space it out after, and the eight weeks is just sort of a, a general number, but you ideally want to be able to see them for a while and then space it out to every two weeks and every month and every three months and every six months. Um, and a lot of that comes with some of the other things you do that we're going to talk about in a little bit. So what are the contraindications? What are the reasons not to do acupuncture on somebody? So if there's a local infection or tumor, you're not going to put a needle in the site that can either spread the, it can have tumor seeding or you can make the, in the infection worse. Um, if somebody has severe neutropenia, which means one of the white blood cells that fights bacteria is really low, this is a relative contraindication, I'm going to say, and that's because there aren't human adult studies looking at this. There's some in the pediatric population that say it's okay, but for right now, and we, I hopefully in the next few years are going to do a safety study at UCSF looking at this question, does it increase your, your risk of infection? Pregnancy for certain points. So acupuncture and pregnancy is fantastic. There was a study done just last year where they looked at acupuncture and pregnancy, and they did two different points, and both of the sets of points that they did, they used electrical stimulation, reduced the duration of, um, active phase of the first active phase of labor, and improved pain scores. Um, so acupuncture and pregnancy works really well, um, but if someone doesn't want to deliver, there's certain points you can't use or you should avoid because they induce contractions. An AICD or a pacemaker, so an AICD is an automatic internal cardiac defibrillator, and a pacemaker is a cardiac uh, device as well. And the reason you don't want to do electricity around that is you may mess up the electricity of the devices or the wires themselves. So you just want to be careful around that. And then bleeding dyscrasia is an anticoagulation. So if somebody's on Coumadin, if somebody's on heparin, if somebody's on one of the newer novel um, oral anticoagulants, if they have very low platelets, so far it seems like it's safe and we don't really worry about increasing bleeding. So I would still go ahead with that because the needles are so tiny that it's still safe to do. A lot of people worry about that, but in general it's safe. So just kind of a summary on acupuncture. It's safe, it's inexpensive. There are a few contraindications to it. We really don't understand this idea of chi that well or energy in Western medicine, and that's the basis of how the system was developed. We don't understand how it was developed because of that. It works well for many patients. It is well tolerated and often even enjoyable for patients, and it doesn't fit into our current research methods. Donald Abrams, who's one of our oncologists here who does a lot of research, one, one thing that he does is he recommends acupuncture for all of his cancer patients. The reason being, he, he describes this thing that in Western medicine, we're, we're expelling the bad. So we're, we're giving chemotherapy, we're, we're killing the tumors, and we're getting rid of all the negative things and negative consequences of, of this disease, but we're not doing anything to nourish the good in a person. And so one thing that happens with acupuncture is you're kind of boosting, this, there's this idea that you're boosting somebody's constitution, and you're really helping them cope and adapt and deal with all of the consequences of the cancer treatments. So he recommends it universally to his patients as a really important part of their cancer care. Okay, and please keep in mind, I am hugely biased on acupuncture. I sh that should be a disclaimer, I guess, too. Um, so now I wanna get to the beyond part of our talk. Um, and this is kind of addressing health and pain holistically. And this, kind of, this comes from the Eastern idea in both Chinese medicine and Ayurveda, which are, are whole systems of thought that we need to address everything a person is doing if we're gonna be addressing their health. And that there's many, many different ways we can get to that. So we're gonna kind of briefly review some of these because all of these topics are gigantic talks in and of themselves. But I just wanna give you some highlights for each of them. Um, and so we'll talk about diet, medication, herbs, and supplements, very briefly. Exercise, breathing, meditation, sleep, optimism, well-being, and joy, community, spirituality and connection, and the importance of all of these in pain. Despite how long this list is, it is not exhaustive by any means. And there are many things that I've left out, including manual medicine, which is, um, I'll touch briefly on massage with one study, but massage and manual medicine, manual therapies, kind of things like rolfing or deeper tissue work, some of the chiropractic work and um, uh, adjustment kind of things and music therapy and art therapy, which are also really beautiful things that have been shown to help with pain. And so those are gonna be outside of the scope of this talk. So let's just talk about pain for a second. And so usually when we think about pain, we think of an injury of some kind. But pain really affects every level of being, and, and you could describe pain in any way. And so when I kind of think about the big four domains of a person, the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects, each of those can have pain. And each of those pains can manifest in a, a physical symptom of pain even if there isn't an actual injury. And we see this a lot, I think, in the hospital and a lot in our pain service. Um, 
And it's less effective to just treat one aspect of a person's pain, which is what we tend to focus on with, um, with a lot of our interventions. It's really focusing on the physical aspect of pain. Although last week, I think you had a probably wonderful discussion about different ways that we can affect the mental aspects of pain. Um, and so I just did a quick pain image search. And so kind of each of these are sort of different things. I think that might be existential angst related to studying. Um, you have a, a little cut there, and then this seems like a broken heart of some kind. It's a little dramatic, so it's probably like a teenager who just broke up with somebody. That's my guess. Um, and so kind of addressing how do we deal with all of these, these different ways that someone can hurt because all of these are important and all of these are gonna manifest in, in unhealth of some kind. So let's talk a little bit about diet. There have been many, many, many studies on diet and inflammatory mediators. There have been many, many studies on inflammatory mediators in pain. There have not been many, many studies on diet and pain and the direct effect. And that's because it's really hard to study that in people and have them really stick to a diet. And so, I'm mostly going to go over this idea of this anti-inflammatory diet and some components of health that all of you can start doing if you want right away. Um, so berries in general are really good for us, it turns out. Um, they are one of the dirty, well, each of these is on the like dirty dozen, which is really a list of 15 things. And they're important to have organic. In general, when you're thinking about fruits and vegetables and you're trying to decide, is it worth the extra amount for organic? If you're eating the skin, the answer is yes, almost invariably. Organic is interesting because it doesn't just have less of the things we don't want, it has more of the phytonutrients and some of the active things that we really do want from it. And so, as much as organic is a bit of a buzzword right now, um, it, for berries, please, please do go organic. It's okay if you do frozen, that might be a more cost-effective way of doing it. And it's also easy that we don't have to worry about them spoiling. Um, but fresh in general is better, organic in general is better, um, especially for berries and meat. Um, this next thing that I've had is taken from the Osher Center. So if you go to the Osher UCSF site, you can go to the diet site there, and there's specifically diet information about cancer prevention. But all of the cancer prevention stuff is, um, is the anti-inflammatory diet for the most part. So the basic idea is that most of your diet should be vegetables. So, and, and in thinking of it as more vegetables and fruits than fruits and vegetables is probably the way to go. So you wanna have at least five servings of these. You wanna eat as brightly colored and varied as you can. The reason being is, it's, I, I think this is one of the coolest things, but they're color coded by the nutrients that they have. So things that are orange tend to have similar beta carotene in them. And so getting different colors will really help you have a broad sampling in your diet of a lot of phytonutrients that can be really helpful. Um, legumes and whole grains are really helpful too. Um, so beans in general, especially if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, beans can be a really good source of iron amongst other things. Whole grains are nice because they slow the di they're slow, slowly digested, so you don't get the big spikes in your glycemic index that you do with, with more processed things. And this is where it gets a little deceptive, the way food is advertised. So a lot of whole grain bread was at one point whole grain, but then it was ground down to flour, and so your body's going to process that like sugar. So simple rules with bread, you want to see grains in it if you're going to have it, and you don't want to be able to crunch it up into a ball. Those are usually, that's, that's a bad prognostic sign if it's like Wonder Bread. Um, you wanna have health, healthy fats, and there is a big debate between two of the main gurus of kind of modern diet things. So um, Dean Ornish likes a diet that's really low in fat. He, he prefers a 10% kind of fat of your calories coming from fat diet. And then Andrew Weil prefers 30% fat. There hasn't been a head-to-head -head on these two. Um, but I would like, but fats in general don't seem to be the biggest enemy if you have good fats. And so that's monounsaturated fats and fatty acids and polyunsaturated fatty acids. And omega-3s have been getting a lot of good press lately for good reason. And in fact, are the number one use supplement with 7% of US adults. I'm pretty sure that statistic is right. Um, using it in the 2012 survey. And so you can get that from wild caught salmon is a really good example of that. Oddly enough, farm raised salmon, not a good source of omega-3s. Um, and it's because it's the food that they eat is really what makes up the diet behind it. Cold water fish in general, so cod, herring, sardines, those kind of things actually are really high in omega-3, these oily fishes. Um, avocados has healthy fats, olive oil, and olives. And so olive oil is pr it's really one of the healthiest things out there for us. It seems to be good for what ails you in a lot of ways. So it's a great cooking oil, but keep in mind that it has a low heating temperature, so you can't cook really hot on it, or you're gonna get a lot of glycos glycosylated end products. So you wanna be careful 
and use it more for, for low heat kind of things. Um, animal proteins you want to include more sparingly, and you want to do organic when you can for those. Um, in general, lean chicken is, is pretty healthy. Eggs there's a huge debate on, but it seems like some eggs are okay. And a lot of people recommend cutting out dairy altogether. Um, I grew up in a small dairy town in northern New York, so I don't recommend that. Um, I think for some people it is important, and I've had patients who have come in. Um, one of my patients, she's a you know, 60 some odd year school teacher, has been suffering from allergies for a long, long time, and came in for acupuncture for her allergies, and she improved the treatments, but then as we were talking, we just had her cut out dairy, and they completely resolved. And, and so even these odd allergic symptoms um, can go away if you, if you do have a, a dairy sensitivity. Um, oh, while we're on that, the gluten thing. So the gluten sensitivity is a really tough one, right? So all these people in the world are probably not sensitive to gluten the way that we're seeing. Um, in China, in fact, gluten is something that you can eat. It's, it's a part of the meal. But there's probably something wrong with the way that we're making our grains since it's, it's, a, it's a highly processed, um, I was about to say highly processed process, and now I can't think of a better way out of that. Um, but um, in general, the, the gluten thing, it probably is unhealthy for a lot of people, but it might be the type of grains you're having. And so I tend to be cautious on having people peel away from that. And real celiac disease is uncommon, but, but really serious. And so it's nice that there's all these gluten-free things now, because I think it was really difficult for those people before. Um, herbs and spices. The amount of research that's coming out on different spices is phenomenal. And the amount of um, benefits that you have. So turmeric, for example, and, and one of the, the yellow dye compounds, the curcumin parts of that, have really been looked at for, for anti-inflammatory properties. And this idea of cancer prevention, none of the studies on cancer prevention for anything have panned out yet, but there's been a lot of promising leads. Um, but curcumin and turmeric in rheumatoid arthritis has been, and osteoarthritis has been shown to have great effects. So just adding it to your food, um, if you are going to add turmeric to your food for anti-inflammatory general properties, you want to add black pepper to it. The pepperine in black pepper increases the absorption by tenfold. Some people say a hundredfold. If you're doing it for gastrointestinal health, so if you have inflammatory bowel disease, even if you have an oddly enough irritable bowel syndrome, or if you're doing it for some of the, the chemopreventative things for GI cancers, you want to take it in between meals without black pepper. But if you're taking it for more general anti-inflammatory things, you want to take it with food, with black pepper. Um, and a, a lot of people will reference the Indian diet where people have you know, multiple grams of that a day. Um, so turmeric has a distinct flavor. It's a little bit of a chalky taste. I grew up on it. I like it. Um, but if you don't, you can take the curcumin compounds, which are, which are pills. Um, other spices have really been shown to be helpful as well for many, many different things. So a lot of people use ginger for digestion. And a lot of you may have experimented with different herbs and noticed a big effect on different things as well. So we really encourage liberal use of spices. One, because it's a, a no-calorie way of changing the way your food tastes. And two, because a lot of them have really healthy and, and powerful properties. Green tea. Green tea seems to be good for what ails you to some extent. Um, in general, a lot of the studies are positive, but a lot of the studies will also show that you need massive amounts of green tea to get some of the anti-cancer effects. It seems like five cups a day is where you really start to see some of the big benefits. So I like green tea. I don't drink five cups of it a day, but I think there are probably other benefits too that we may not be measuring. In general, it's a nice way to get a little bit of caffeine, but not too much. And then dark chocolate is sort of the, in, the, the slightly, I mean, it's the only dessert place on this, right? And so, <laughs> but dark chocolate's nice. It seems to have a lot of heart healthy benefits. It does have a lot of phytonutrients and has anti-inflammatory properties. That's really like, like the 100% dark chocolate. So most people will say you want to be 80% good with your diet, and the other 20% really enjoy. So, <laughs> but once you start eating healthy, you'll start to notice you'll start to feel different, and you'll also notice how hard it is to do. I think a lot of that is because of how we've been raised and just how much we get slammed with advertising and the subtle effects that implicit bias plays in our choices when we eat in general and most things that we do. Um, do, we, do, do any of you recognize what this is? Oh, great. You're way better than I am. So this is also appears as like a ginkgo thing that appears in uh, the Mission Bay um, entryway. But this is ginkgo. Studies on ginkgo have been a little disappointing in some ways and positive in others. I'm not going to go into herbs too much, but I will say I think it's a little bit strange that there are just herbs that have been purportedly used for a specific use for thousands of years. And then most of our studies turn out to be kind of neutral on it. 
And then a single isolated compound from that herb will get marketed for the same thing with a lot of company funding, and then suddenly all those studies are positive. It's really strange, and I think it has to do with the fact that we have probably underfunding for a lot of our herb research. And so I'm hoping that's gonna change. But a lot of the products taken from ginkgo have been shown to be effective for some of the Alzheimer prevention and dementia care. But ginkgo in general, the studies have been a little disappointing. Um, what I wanna talk to you about with herbs and supplements is things to be wary of and things to keep in mind. So herbs and supplements are not that regulated. In fact, they're barely regulated. A few years ago, they did that big raid of Targets and Walmarts and pulled all these things and found that they didn't have most of what they were supposed to have in them. It's getting better, but not that much better. So you want to make sure that you're using a good product. We'll show some resources in a second to do that. And also, I would love for you to talk to your doctors about it. So depending on who your doctor is, they may say don't take any herbs or supplements, but still talk to them about it, just so they're aware. They're often dangerous to use outside of context. So you may remember, if you're old enough, the Mahuang thing that happened, and that's the, the ephedra. And so Mahuang in Chinese medicine is used in really low doses, and it's used for respiratory disease. It's used for asthma, which makes sense when we think about the analogs in Western medicine. It ended up being marketed as a weight loss supplement and was used in 100 to 1,000 times the concentration and, and, and given, yeah, exactly, fenfen, and it was given with caffeine as well. And then a lot of people, a lot of people got heart attacks and a lot of people died. By a lot, I mean like five, but more than zero and more than would have happened with Mahuang when it's used in its traditional context. And so it was pulled from the market and now you need a special license. I don't even know if we can write for, for Mahuang. I think you need to be an herbalist to be able to do it. Um, so it's just keep in mind that used outside of the context it was created in, it can be dangerous. Mahuang does work really well to lose weight because it's like speed. It's like taking a methamphetamine. Uh, so a lot of times when we use something not the way it's intended, it can be dangerous. It's hard to study a lot of these herbs because they have multiple active compounds. And these can work incredibly well and address gaps in our current treatment. So I was just seeing somebody recently who has metastatic lung cancer. And the main thing, she's doing really well with the Tarceva treatment that she's taking. And her scans have been really good. The fatigue part has been hard to address. After an acupuncture treatment, she'll feel better for a day or so. But then her energy levels could drip back down. And, and it's really hard for her because she knows she's feeling better and wants to enjoy her life. But her energy levels have been really low. So one thing that's been studied for cancer-related fatigue is ginseng, American ginseng specifically. The difference between American ginseng and Asian ginseng is American ginseng is a little bit less anxiety kind of causing, and it's a more calming agent. But it's been used in cancer, and it works really well for cancer-related fatigue so far from what we're seeing. And that's an example of an herb addressing a gap for something that we just don't have in Western medicine. We don't have a medication to treat cancer-related fatigue. Resources to learn more. And so if any of you are interested in herbs or if you're taking herbs, so at UCSF, if you're a member at UCSF, this is a free database that you can use, the Natural Medicines Comprehensive Database and Natural Standards. There's third-party testing at com consumer labs that you can pay for. It's 2 to $3 a month. This is what I tend to use when I'm looking up things that patients have because there's a lot more things that are studied on it. Um, and then the University of Maryland and Sloan Kettering have wonderful websites. Lately, I've been preferring Sloan Kettering to show patients because it's a little prettier. Um, but it will give you kind of an overview. So you type in the herb, and it will give you an example of the research that's been done on it, the dose you're supposed to take it to, take it for, what its reported effects are, and what the studies back up as effects that are um, confirmed. Okay, let's talk about exercise a little bit. So, exercise and pain. So in general, exercise seems to be good for most things. The more you exercise the smarter you get. It's better if you're, if you're studying, you wanna make sure you're exercising, your brain works better. If you're exercising, your mood is better. And also there was this interesting study done a few years ago where they took healthy individuals and they randomized them to a structured six week aerobic exercise class and they had them grasp as hard as they could with this grip strength thing onto, onto a grip strength device. And they'd, they'd hold it like that and then they'd inflate a blood pressure cuff and cut off their circulation and see how long they could hold it for at that full strength. And so what they found at the end of this is that patients who, or participants who did the six-week structured aerobic, aerobic workout test had a much increased ability to, to, to hold on to this grip despite the pain. And so they, they took that to mean that there was an increase in pain threshold um, because you could stop it at any time if you wanted. And it, that's the idea of this increased ischemic pain tolerance, which is fascinating. There was also a recent review on another, other forms of exercise, so it also included massage, 
but it looked at yoga and Tai Chi and the effects on knee pain and found overall that most of the studies were beneficial. The challenge with yoga and Tai Chi is they're hard to blind. So it's hard to do a blinded controlled trial on those. But those moving meditations and those exercises, those gentle forms of exercise also seem to be good for pain. And one thing that I really like about Tai Chi that I haven't seen with anything else is the 75% reduction in hip fractures in people who did Tai Chi versus people who did not. This is a 2006 study, but that's remarkable. That's more than almost anything else. And I think it's probably because of all the gentle movements and the hip stuff involved in it. Recently, I've become increasingly suspicious that Hulu, uh, I'm sorry, Hula, like the Hula dance, and things that use your pelvis probably have similar effects to yoga and Tai Chi. I think there's something about that core strengthening and loosening of the pelvis that's really important. So this is just an example of the kind of moving meditation in Tai Chi. And that's to get us to this idea of meditation. Uh, how many people here meditate regularly? Wow, all right. How many people have thought about meditating and had difficulty putting it in? <laughs> yeah, there's something uniquely hard about meditation. And I think the reason is, is that meditation for most people feels like this. You're supposed to sit there and do nothing. You're just, you're just there. And that's really hard for us because we feel like we're expected to be productive all the time. And so meditation feels like a waste of time. And it's really challenging to quiet your mind. When you sit there and realize you, you want to not think thoughts, you notice how many thoughts that I have. And that's a little bit uncomfortable. So what I'd like us to do together is, this, is a breathing exercise that's kind of a bridge between meditation and my computer freezing. But give me a moment. So I'll, We'll, we'll, we'll do this anyways, we can talk about it. So, um, so the breathing exercise is something that Andrew Weil really likes. It's called four, seven, eight breathing. I don't know if any of you have done this before, but what we're gonna do together is, and it's, it's the relative counts that matter. We're gonna breathe in through our nose and let our belly expand for a count of four. We're gonna hold it for a count of seven, and we're gonna breathe out for a count of eight. For time's sake, we're just gonna do that once together, but normally you'll do that for a cycle of four. You can do it just in the morning, and then you can do it in the evening, and you'll start to notice you'll feel a lot calmer. I like using it when I'm at work and somebody's annoying me, and it's a nice way to calm down. And so it works really, really well as a calming kind of thing, and um, some of my colleagues use it for acute pain as well, when somebody's having pain in between other interventions, to have somebody start doing this breathing. So, all right, everyone together. So I'll just keep my hands up as a count. So let's breathe in through our nose. So. Hold it. And then out through our mouth with a whooshing noise. Feel free to keep repeating it on your own for cycles of four. So this is a great exercise. You can do it on your own, and it just is very relaxing. And there's something about the cycle of four that's helpful, too. And it's this idea of mindfulness. So. A lot of people that I see in clinic now are really annoyed by the word mindfulness because it's, it's everywhere and it's kind of the buzzword right now, which is true. Some people like heartfulness and say that if you look at the original word that mindfulness comes from, it's kind of a combination of mind-heart. Um, and it's this idea of focusing your attention specifically. And that it often starts with the breath and returning to the breath is one of the main ways we do it. Four, seven, eight breathing is a nice, easy way of doing that because it gives you something to think about in addition to your breath. That counting can be a little distracting and can be nice. And it's this training of the mind. And what some of the research has found is it's the shifting of your attention and back and continuing to bring it back to the same thing that has a lot of the beneficial effects. And what are the effects of meditation? So this modulation of the autonomic nervous system. So it's, it's a little different than just relaxation. It seems like it's relaxation that lasts longer. It enhances your immune system, which is fascinating. This idea that by meditating, I'm gonna boost my endurance and my tolerance to other things by reducing your inflammatory cytokines and it increases some antibody productions and studies with vaccines. There are some brain changes. So they, this is looking at monks who do this all the time, but they had increased thickness of their left prefrontal cortex and increased activity. And there's some endocrine changes that happen. There's reduced cortisol, which is one of the stress hormones. It's something that many Americans have too much of on a regular basis, and increased melatonin. And so these are kind of fascinating changes for meditation. And then there's mindfulness-based stress reduction, or MBSR. And this is something that's gained a lot of popularity it was created initially in 1979 by John Kabat-Zinn. It comes from Buddhist tradition, but it's taught in a secular format. It's an eight-week structured class that's about 28 hours in total, and it's deliberate, sustained, non-judgmental attention. And it enhances self-awareness. It changes your maladaptive thinking. 
it increases your ability to respond skillfully and it reduces suffering overall, um, which sounds pretty awesome, right? And it, it, most of our research so far has shown that it's pretty great. There's been such a big increase in the study that I think if I did this talk two years ago, I would have said over two, 100, 120 studies. But now there's over 200 and counting. And it's been shown to be particularly effective for anxiety, depression, stress, pain, and this idea of cancer-related symptoms. So things like mood disturbances, anxiety, stress, and quality of life, but in a person who has cancer. Um, there were 19 studies with over 1,200 patients who have all shown improved quality of life, acceptance, pain tolerance, and mood, which is pretty remarkable. In general, it's pretty well tolerated, and this 2013 review study that was looking at pain specifically had 10 out of 16 studies that showed a significant reduction, which is good, not great. And so who's right for mindfulness-based stress reduction? It's a, it's a big time commitment. So you're going to go for once a week for your class for two to two and a half hours. You're going to be sharing your experience with your classmates. And then you're going to do a four-hour retreat on a Saturday somewhere in there. And so that's a big time commitment, and it's really structured. And so that's not necessarily for everybody. The contraindications to mindfulness-based stress reduction, debatably some forms of meditation. Um, I didn't include in here for other forms of meditation. A lot of people think autism is not necessarily a good thing to do with meditation because you're already very focused in a way. Um, but con untreated psychosis, mania, and intoxication with active substances is not a good idea for MBSR. And so how do you know if it's right for you, if any of you are interested? I would recommend going to an informational session and seeing if you like it, which are a two to two and a half hour class. The next one is at the Osher Center. I don't get any royalties from anything I'm talking about. Um, but it's the next one is at the Osher Center two Wednesdays from now. Um, and it's, that's at Divisadero on Post Street. And this is the phone number. And I think it's in your handouts as well. But if you're interested in seeing, I would, I would go check it out. And their mindfulness class is taught everywhere. So just see if you like the teacher, because I think that's an important part of the class. Another form of this kind of meditation that's, it's, it's a meditation but also a hypnosis, is this idea of guided imagery. Another sample, has anybody done guided imagery here? Okay, excellent. Um, so less people. So guided imagery, it, it's, it's often grouped with hypnosis because it is a form of self-hypnosis when you do it yourself. You can do it alone, but it's actually a lot better with a practitioner. The thing about guided imagery that I like is how scalable it is since it can be done with recording you don't need a practitioner, but it is much more effective if you have an individual skilled practitioner working with you to do guided imagery geared towards you. And uh, Dr. Marty Rossman, Martin Rossman, lives in Larkspur, and he created the Guided Imagery Foundation. And, and he has a website called The Healing Mind. And so I'm just going to play briefly for you an audio clip of what this sounds like, assuming it works. OK, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Replacing worn out elements and molecules and recharging the batteries of life. So it's kind of this gentle, peaceful, With every breath you release, your body sort of sleep-inducing thing. And most people ask me if it's OK if they fall asleep during it. And I, I really hope so, because it's probably going to happen. Um, but in general, it's nice, because you can do it on your own. It's relaxing. It's calming. It's had some decent studies looking at pain. A, 20, 000, a 2011 review looked at nine studies, and eight of those had positive results for guided imagery and musculoskeletal pain. They did note that the studies weren't that good, but eight of the nine did show positive results. And a 2012 review looking at studies that it deemed were good quality had five out of six of those showing use for post-operative pain, abdominal and non-musculoskeletal pain. And right now at UCSF, there's a study underway looking at perioperative pain and outcomes with guided imagery in neurologic patients. It's also something that is really nice because of how easy it is for somebody to do on their own, whereas a lot of this you need a practitioner to do. Again, it is better with somebody, but it, you can do it on your own as well. So I thought guided imagery and sleep kind of start to go together. And so sleep is really, really important. I think most of you know how different you feel on a night where you slept well, or a day following a night where you slept well versus a night where you have not. And what we're starting to see more and more on, on the inpatient side in the hospital is that sleep also affects patient outcomes. Patient outcomes that don't seem to have anything to do with sleep. And what we're seeing with pain research is in animal studies and starting in human studies, although it's a little bit difficult to show, we know that chronic pain patients and patients with fibromyalgia and other pain syndromes have worse sleep. But it looks like there's a bi-directional bi result and that 
having poor sleep makes your pain sensitivity worse as well. And so there's been a bunch of different studies, most of which have not been controlled, where they'll keep people up for a few days and then they'll test different types of pain, like thermal response to pain and then pressure response to pain, with variable results, but most of them will find that your pain sensations are altered if you're sleep deprived. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and I just listed four review studies that all kind of show the same thing when they say, it's promising, but we need more studies. And a lot of the animal studies have been pretty positive on that, where they keep somebody up and then they do something cruel to the animal and see how quickly they withdraw. Not that cruel. I mean, it's, it's good. It's probably better now than it was, but, um, but not that nice probably. And so it seems like getting sleep is a really important thing for pain. And it's really challenging for a lot of our pain patients because they're not able to sleep because of their pain. So this is something else that I think is fascinating, and this is the effects of optimism on outcomes and, and optimism on health. Um, so this is, this is taken from a, a study from a few years ago, and it was looking at optimism and the experience of pain. And this was kind of their ideas on how optimism affects, affects pain. So the idea is that if you're optimistic, you're gonna have better coping strategies, and your adjustment to pain is gonna be better. If you have if you're optimistic, your cognitive processing of the pain is also going to be better, and you're going to activate different areas in your brain that will help modulate the pain and help your endogenous pain processing. So the idea that being optimistic not only changes the pain that you're feeling, but also changes the way that you're going to respond to that pain. And there have been multiple studies looking at optimism and placebo, and they found that optimistic people tend to respond better to placebo, which makes sense. And so in general, I have not found a study yet where they take people who have a negative attitude and train them to be optimistic and see what happens to their pain, but that may be a direction that we're going in. And then there's this idea of well-being and, and well-being in general. And so there's this, there's this study in England, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, um, also known as ELSA, where they're taking um, pe people in England who are age 15 and above, and they've been following them for decades. And they look at their health outcomes, their social outcomes, and this was part of a bigger study that was done on a worldwide level. And so what they found is this eudaimonic well-being means do you think your life has purpose and do you think your life has meaning? And so people who ranked higher on this live longer. So if you look at the red one, it basically goes in order of, well, almost order. The second and third are a little reverse. But the people who had the lowest level of, of meaning and sense of purpose in their life lived the shortest compared to those who had the highest, who lived longer. And there's a lot of things that are looking at this idea of well-being. And, and this kind of relates to that idea of resiliency, which has also become more of a buzzword recently, and your ability to adapt and cope to change and to cope to trauma. And so it seems like there's something important about just having this joy and having this happiness in your life helps you deal with negative things. And, and I think that ties to both optimism and well-being. And also there's this idea of, of kind of social structure and I think, um, have, how many of you here read um, Being Mortal by Atul Gawande? So a few, okay. So there's this, there's this, one of the things that he brings up in that case in regards to death and dying is that we don't have our village structure anymore. And so a lot of us, especially in the modern society, it becomes increasingly easy to participate in society but still be alienated and still be isolated. And, and what we know about socializing and community is that there really important. <laughs> so looking at a lot of the human and animal studies on, on what happens when you socialize. So it's really complicated, and it's really complex, and it's hard to study. But one of the things that have, seems to happen is you have increased oxytocin release. And for those of you who aren't familiar with oxytocin, it's kind of the warm, happy hormone where it increases your communal response with each other. And this is, and it's triggered by specifically warm interpersonal interactions. And so it increases your bonding, it increases your pain threshold. And this has been shown in both animals and human studies, that having higher levels of oxytocin, which has been manipulated in different ways, one by giving it to both human and animals, but also by, um, by having them socialize, increases your ability to tolerate pain but there, it's released in this. It, it is interestingly also what makes you cliquish. And so there's, it's not perfectly without risk. It does make you bond specifically to a group and decreases your bonding with other groups. But it does seem to have an important contribution and something that we're potentially going to start exploring more with pain. So with animal studies, they can do things more specifically where they'll give an animal pain. 
uh, they'll give an animal oxytocin and then do a painful stimuli. And they find that the kind of paw withdrawal from pain is much increased with higher doses of oxytocin. And it's pretty fascinating that that's true. And it's an entirely different way of treating pain than we're doing right now. And so when I see somebody in clinic, in general, some of the things I recommend is, and it's tough because these people are in pain. And so it's hard for them to exercise and it's hard for them to get out and socialize. So we'll, we'll kind of come up with different ways that, that they can do what they enjoy and they can do it with other people. So often free museum days is a good one, a good place to get out and start interacting with people. So really recommend socializing in community. And then the last part is this idea of spirituality and connection that I tend to talk to patients about. And so spirituality is a really tough concept. It means different things to different people. For some people, it's going to church. For some people, it's, it's Hindu gods. For some people, it's walking in nature or sitting outside or enjoying a beautiful day. And so spirituality varies a lot from person to person. And it's been somewhat understudied. And so a really interesting review in, in pain medicine from last year stated that the evidence that we do have about pain and spirituality suggests that, pain, that spirituality is just as important, if not more important and relevant than in other fields. And it also went on to say we need more studies on it. Um, spiritual well-being in general is linked with higher pain tolerance psychological well-being, and life satisfaction. And so all of those things together, I think it, a lot of people kind of question, is it this idea that if you're more spiritual or if you have a spiritual practice, that your pain has meaning? And that idea of meaning in your pain may be related to this eudonomic well-being. And is, this, is it that, that idea that you take meaning from your pain help you deal with it and cope with it in different ways? And it's a fascinating question, and I think we're starting to explore spirituality a lot in palliative care and recognizing at end of life how important it is. But I think we're going to start doing a lot of increasing work with chronic pain patients and pain patients in general and in their spirituality and helping add some meaning to the context of what they're experiencing. And so that was the brief, the brief whirlwind. Um, for further reading on acupuncture, I, I chose two books. So one is The Power of Five Elements by Charles Moss. I really like this book specifically for people to, to take because it goes through this idea of the underlying constitutions that different people have. So there's five elements in Chinese medicine and each of those has a personality and a, a physical archetype and a sort of a makeup that comes with it. In um, Ayurveda, there's also five different elements, but they break those down into three doshas. So the idea of this power of five elements, it goes through the different types and types of uh, constitutions. It helps you identify which one you are and then it identifies coping strategies that are specific for your constitution. And so I, I really like it as a book to have to people read for themselves. One is really interesting. It's kind, of, it's kind of like if any of you have done the Myers-Briggs thing, right after you do that, you try to analyze everybody you know. You'll do the same thing with this, but in a Chinese medicine way. And so it, it adds another layer of analyzing your friends and family. Um, and then there's The Web That Has No Weaver by Ted Kapchuk, which is a fantastic book. It is dense for you if you're not that interested in acupuncture, but it really goes into the Chinese medicine framework of thinking and that exploration of health and the idea of, of what does spleen dampness mean and, and how that doesn't, doesn't mean that there's a problem with your spleen. Um, and so well, thank you all very much. And now I'd like to open it for questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you.